Welcome and thank you for attending this week's webinar, Hazard Identification, Risk Assessment and Determining Controls Foundation Zone of OHSAS 18001. My name is Aaron and I'm the Product Manager for Health, Safety and Environment. This webinar will be presented by Mohamed Davoud, PCB Partner, Chemical Engineer and General Manager of Sustainable Business Solutions. If you have any questions during the presentation, please write us in the question box located in the control panel. Mohamed, please, you may start the presentation. Yeah, sure. Thanks very much, Arun. And welcome you all to this webinar on hazard identification, risk assessment, and controls. Myself, Mohamed Al, and here you can see my contact details, my email ID, that you can contact me even after the webinar if you have any specific question regarding the risk assessment that is an integral part of OSAS 18001 standard. The objective of this webinar is to basically enable all participants to carry out the risk assessment of your own facility or at least you should develop such competence that you'll be part of the risk assessment team. So first thing, what is a risk assessment? It's a careful examination of what can go wrong in your facility that can be a part of people, equipment, environment or property. What can harm you? Although sitting here like people in uh, property environment, but because we are talking in the context of OSAS 18001, which is uh, more oriented towards uh, personal safety, so we'll rather refer it as anything that can cause harm to any individual, any staff, any worker on your facility. So why should we need to carry out a risk assessment? First of all, it's a legal requirement in most, uh, most parts of the world uh, that you need to carry out a risk assessment of your facilities. It's also a compulsory requirement that you need to have a documented procedure of OSAS 18001 uh, of a risk assessment and you need to carry out the risk assessment of all routine and non-routine activities of your facility. It also helps you to segregate uh, some critical activities from your routine activities so you can pay more attention, you can focus more on some critical activities that are causing maybe more accidents to your, uh, in your facility. Because uh, 18001 is a basically a British standard, so we'll, we'll more, uh, be referring more British guidelines and terminology. So one of the terminologies that is referred in risk assessment is reasonably practicable. Like, let me give you a simple scenario. We all know traveling in the air can be lethal, but still we travel in the air. We, we can avoid it. We can use maybe some alternate route. We can use maybe a public bus, a train, or even a bicycle to commute from one city to other or a country to country, but there is some time, cost and efforts involved. So we always compare the hazard with the three things, cost, time and efforts. And these are the three things that determine the practicability of how, how much risk reduction is sufficient. And this is the basis of the risk assessment. Even if you know the hazard, if you know the risk still, at many times you cannot remove that hazard because it's not practicable. It's possible, it's possible that we avoid the traveling in the air, but it's not practicable because if we have to travel like 2,000 miles, we will rather up for air travel as compared to going on a bicycle because in the air, you know, it's a, it's a certain death in case of a plane crash, but in case of a bicycle accident, you won't die at least, but still you accept that level of risk to save your time. Some basic terminologies here, accident or incident. So any unplanned, unwanted happening that had the potential to cause harm, but there's no actual harm. It, it's, it's a near miss case. You can find these uh, basic definitions at the start of OSAS 18001 standard as well. So accident is referred to any unplanned, unwanted happening that has resulted in some kind of harm. And again, with harm, we mean environmental harm or or property damage or a personal injury. No, that harm can be an injury or a property damage. So if there is an injury, it's an injury accident. And if it's a property damage case, it's a damage only accident. It may be the both that a particular happening has damaged your property and that same happening has also resulted in some kind of injury as well. So that can be referred to as an accident resulting in injury as well as the damages. Dangerous occurrence 
this is an unsafe condition that has to be reported by law like a toxic gas release which has not resulted in some kind of harm directly but still uh, there could be huge it's a huge potential that there could be a severe injuries or even fatalities depending upon the nature of the gas and then at the end we have work related ill health any ill health case that is directly attributable to the work situation for example if you are working in high rise area it could be tinnitus or your hearing loss or if you are working with vibrating equipment like heavy equipment it could be hand arm vibration syndrome or it could be <coughs> dermatitis if you are handling with diesel or some other chemicals or it could be your respiratory system damage if you, are, if you have been working in some atmosphere uh, with the toxic gases so here's a simple illustration between hazard near miss and injury you have, you can see some loose material on a scaffolding which is a hazard hazard anything that has the potential to cause harm so if, if that loose material falls down but it narrowly misses someone it's a near miss it could have damaged a prop or it could have injured that person but it's just it's a near miss because it has not uh, resulted in some kind of damage and on the last picture on your right hand side on your screens you can see if that material falls on some individual it will result an injury and it would be classified as an injury accident so it's an accident because there is some kind of harm and because that harm is related to an individual so it is an injury accident now if you see the literature you can find out many uh, triangles or many pyramids like this this is called accident triangle or accident pyramid frank bird is one of the researchers who, who carried out this research and he came up with these figures there are different figures you, you may some where you may see some variation among these figures but the overall linkage or the overall relationship between the figure remains the same in, in all the research like this triangle developed by friend but it says for every one serious injury there would be 10 minor injuries 30 damages and 600 incidents like incident and planned unwanted happenings only so if we our focus point need to be at the bottom, the 600 figure, because if we are able to control the 600 figure, we, we are ultimately stopping the serious injuries at the top. But if our focus is at the top, like the serious injury, the incidents or damages only, they will keep happening and ultimately we'll end up with a serious injury or fatality, fatality also one day. So risk assessment, so who need to carry out the risk assessment? It's a teamwork. So we develop a team. There can be like three to six percent in a team depending upon the complexity of the area. All, all people they need to be competent. So competent means the people involved who are the part of the team or who are involved in developing the risk assessment. They need to have the knowledge of how to carry out the risk assessment. They need to have some previous experience of developing the risk assessment. They need to have the knowledge of the area they are working in and they need to have the knowledge of the activity they are going to undertake the risk assessment of. Because if they, they are missing any of these elements, they won't be able to adequately or comprehensively carry out the risk assessment. So team approach is beneficial and how do we develop the team is that a typical composition of a team could be a health and safety specialist, a technical specialist, especially when, when there is some equipment involved, they may be you may be carrying out the risk assessment of a crane activity or a lifting activity so it's better to involve a technical specialist of a crane or a forklift or if a forklift is involved or any other technical specialist as appropriate a line manager of that area of, or that activity someone familiar with the task so ideally a worker who will be performing that activity or if there are a number of workers from the same craft we, we can get a representative workers because no matter how experienced you are you may, be, you may have done some engineering, you may have carried out more than 50 or 100 risk assessments maybe, but we need to accept the fact that we are not a welder, let's say. We don't know about the ground realities of the welding as good as a welder may know. And we don't know the ground realities of crane behavior, or crane operations as good a crane operator may know. So it's always better to involve a worker. And at the end, a worker safety representative as well can be a part of the team. So this composition may vary a little bit, but typically three to six person will be part of that team. 
it's also team, team approach is also beneficial because in this way you can capture experiences from the different fields so if you make a team of health and safety specialist with a worker technical specialist line manager and worker safety representative you can hear the viewpoint of all another term used in the risk assessment in british system suitable and sufficient so risk assessment need to be suitable and sufficient suitable it need to be appropriate for the area sufficient means that when you identify a risk and when you give a value to risk we'll see in a while how, how do we give the ranking or a value to the to different hazards and the risk or we calculate the level of risk so when you have identified a particular level of risk you need to bring it down to acceptable level so you need to put additional control measures so those control measures should be appropriate should be sufficient to reduce the risk level to an acceptable level so some of the methods that we used in risk assessment so again depending upon your area you, you can not one or more of these methods as appropriate so one of the method is has a the first one hazards and operability studies this is more focused towards the operational industry like process industry maybe fertilizer petrochemical oil and gas and some other industry where there is a process being carried out because it's it identifies operational issues more effectively or FMEA failure modes and effect analysis this focuses on individual equipments like how, how does a particular equipment fail like broadly we can say that we had a fire because a particular pump failed but why that pump failed either it was due to the casing failure due to impeller failure due to vibration due to the base failure due to the skirts failure what was or due to corrosion due to erosion due to impurities what was what was the failure mode of that particular equipment so this technique focuses more on the equipment next is what if analysis this is a brainstorming technique where you ask different what if question what if there is a fire what if there is no cooling water what if there is no steam what if there is no housekeeping what if uh, there is no heating what is the what if there is no ventilation in the area what if there is high noise level so again you make up a team of risk assessment and you just in, you, uh, by brainstorming you can uh, you identify or you create different what if scenarios and then you give answers of those scenarios to identify the hazards another technique that may be of use is lopa or layers of protection analysis we have different layers of protections against a particular hazards like if we talk about a line in the cage so what different protection layer of protection we have we have a cage which is our layer of protection we have the training which is our layer of protection we have supervisor which is a layer of protection we have a uh, security fence which is another layer of protection we have a uh, notice board installed there to warn the visitors of the hazard which is an additional layers of protection so this way we identify different layers of protection how many layers of protections uh, do we have to control that particular hazards and some more techniques uh, that can be of use is bow tie analysis fault tree analysis where you identify the fault this is also called the root cause analysis technique or event tree analysis and the checklist techniques uh, checklist is most widely used for general purposes, especially for the OHS occupational health and safety purposes. We use checklist techniques most widely. In this technique, uh, we just make a checklist of different hazards that can be present in that area, and then we just apply that technique. Someone will take that checklist, go to that particular area for which you want to carry out the risk assessment, and he will just mark as yes or no if that hazard is present in that area or not. So here are the five steps of the risk assessment. Again, don't be confused depending upon the different literatures. You may see somewhere there are four steps of risk assessment. Somewhere you may come across which that still remains the same. So again, you need to uh, follow uh, basically your company procedure. Maybe in your company procedure it's saying there are six steps of risk assessment. Don't worry about it. It's the same thing. So step one, you need to identify the hazards and there are different, different techniques as we have seen in the previous slide what different techniques we can use to identify the hazard so you can select appropriate as per your area in step two we identify the people who may be harmed and how so we need to identify all the people who may be affected by the activities of being carried out in that area 
or by the activities of your facility. After that, we'll evaluate the risk and decide on precaution. So we'll give a value to the risk level, that, uh, to the risk that we have calculated, and we'll see if we have sufficient control measures already in place, and if not, what 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 else we need to do to control that risk level. After that, we'll record all these findings. We'll record whatever we have done. So whatever we have done in first three steps, we need to write it on a piece of paper or in any form, basically. Because OSAD 8000, it just it doesn't say you need to have it on a piece of paper. It could be an audio, it could be a video, it could be a graph, or it could be a piece of paper. So just document it for audit purposes. And at the end, we need to review and upgrade as necessary just to make sure that our risk assessment remains suitable and sufficient. Because developing a risk assessment today does not mean it will remain valid for next 10 years. Your area may change, hazards may change, the occupancy of the area may change. So we need to gather these factors along. So let, let's discuss these steps briefly one by one. Step one, identify all the hazards. Identify all hazards of safe uh, and in here, as, as we have discussed previously, that most widely used technique is checklist for occupational health and safety purposes. So, don't bother about the headings of the category choice. Give some headings of maybe physical hazards, chemical hazards, biological hazard, ergonomic hazard, electrical hazard, vehicle hazard equipment hazards or you may uh, you may wish to segregate on MWP philosophy like material, equipment, environment and people. So it doesn't matter. Just segregate in physical hazards maybe your vibration. If you have like in here we have safety, physical injuries, sleep, falling object, pollution, trapping, crushing machinery, electricity, transport, chemical. So as you think, as as you find it comfortable, you can segregate those hazards. The good point of developing a checklist is it's simple. You need you don't need uh, what you can say. You, you don't need lots of lots of a lot of, lot of competent or uh, expertise to implement or follow a checklist. With, with some basic competence level, you can follow the checklist. Just about observing the area and ticking in the right box yes or no, whether you can see that or anticipate that or no, and that's all. But the negative point is that if you miss something if while you are developing that checklist if you miss to write something on the checklist then when you take that checklist to the area you don't tend to think yourself that you may have to, you may have missed some something that you have not written here so it's always better spend some time more on planning on the development of risk assessment just to ensure that you don't miss anything so there could be a range of as the machinery work at high falling vehicle, slip, trip, house, keeping chemicals, or hazard, any source situation or act with the potential to cause harm in terms of human, of the other one uh, definition section. Like the picture you can see, it's a hazard, so it can cause some kind of harm. So risk what what could be the harm is the risk and it, we calculate the risk by combining the likelihood by the severity of that event so what could, could be harm uh, so this is this is a risky job so he's trying to feed something to a hazard so what could be the risk he may lose his limb he may lose his arm or he, the crocodile person is next steps of risk assessment to identify different people who are at risk and not only the people who are on your facility or who are the permanent member or who are the staff member employed by the company it could be maintenance staff it could be cleaner it could be visitors or contractors or it could be even members of the public for example if you have a refinery or let's say oil and gas facility or a storage facility where you are storing some flammable materials and for the worst case scenario there could be a fire or explosion so you that fire may affect the neighboring community. So you need to identify what could be even the effect of the members of the public, what could be the effect of on a pedestrian who, who is just passing by near your facility. So we need to protect those as well. It's our legal obligation. 
as per uh, British system. So when you identify the people, when you are identifying the people who are at risk of because of the hazards you have already identified, especially focus on the loan workers like security guards who may be working alone. They are more vulnerable because if something goes wrong, there would be no one to help them. Or new and expectant mothers because they are more at risk. We can't expose uh, pregnant women or new mothers to many of the hazards like stress, like night working, like vibration, prolonged sitting or standing. So we need to take care of this issue as well. And disabled workers, disabled it could be like a hearing disability, vision disability or some physical disability. The issue with disabled workers, let's say someone is using wheelchair, so we need to take that consideration in our risk assessment because that person will have difficulty in case of any emergency, it would be difficult for him to evacuate the area. If someone is has hearing disability, he might not be able to hear the evacuation alarm. And similarly, if someone has a vision disability, he might not be able to see some vehicle or someone else coming or see some flashing alarm or things like that. So next steps, evaluate the risk. So how do we evaluate the risk? We need two elements, likelihood and severity of any accidents which has happened. So risk is the multiplication of likelihood and severity. So what we do in here is that we develop a matrix. We give a values to likelihood and severity. Here I have used five by five matrix, which is taken from health and safety guidelines. It's a British guideline. But it's your choice. It's your uh, your company procedure to follow uh, to identify the values to give the values. You may be your company may be using three by three matrix or four by four or five by five or ten by ten doesn't matter. The greater the matrix, more accurate value you will be giving and more comprehensive to the risk assessment. But typically, typically five by five matrix is used in most of the companies. So on the top of this sheet, you see likelihood. So likelihood start from one to five. So one likelihood means. The event could occur in exceptional circumstances only. Like if you think about plane crash, it's not very likely that a plane will crash. Two, unlikely, it could occur at some time, maybe six months to a year. So frequency of the event you're talking about, maybe once or twice in a year. Three means it might occur at some time, monthly, maybe 10 to 12 times a year it happens. Four, likely, it will probably occur in more most circumstances. It could be weekly. Now, this description, is to has to be decided by the risk assessment team of your company. So it, it may be a circumstances six months to a year or monthly, weekly and daily. It may be different in your company. They might have you here five years, here one year. It doesn't matter, but again, the five will give one to five value. One means negligible minor, even if it happens, it's a minor injury. Only the very first aid treatment is required, and nothing beyond that. Two. Consequence means injuries which could result in temporary disability. Three is major serious injuries that could result in permanent disability or maybe hospitalization is required. Four may mean death or permanent disability of one two person, and five may mean several fatalities. Again, you can quantify these uh, in severity down the five value. Now, bring the same values to a matrix, minor, moderate, major, severe, and catastrophic, and values ranging from 1 to 5. And on the other axis, you have likelihood. So likelihood 1, 2, 5. 1 is rare, unlikely, possible, likely, and almost certain. Now, talk about any hazards. You have, let's say, use a checklist, and you have identified that there is electricity, which is a hazard in your facility. So. It can electricity is a hazard. It can cause harm. So, what is the likelihood that someone will be electrocuted in your facility? In a team, select one value. Let's say you just come up with a value of three. That three is the likelihood that someone will be electrocuted. Now, the second aspect, consequence. What would be the consequence if 
someone is electrocuted, it would be a fatality because normally we operate on 110 or 220 volts in different parts of the world. Even 110 is a lethal. So, in that case, as you see here, fatality of 1 to 2 percent will give value likelihood and 4 months resultant would be 12. It's just a simple multiplication of your likelihood and severity value. So 3 to 4 will bring up the risk level of 12. Let's take another example. A plane crash as we've been referring earlier. The likelihood of a plane crash is one. It's no more than one I believe. But what is the severity? It's catastrophic. It's always five or the maximum value you, you have given on your risk matrix. It would be seven or eight. So in this case, five, severity or severity of consequences, same thing, and one likelihood. So five consequences, one likelihood resultant would be five, five risk levels. So similarly, identify all hazards in your facility and give the values of likelihood and consequences to all hazards. When you give these values, just multiply, simple multiplication of likelihood and severity and you'll come up with the values of risk for all, all the hazards in your facility. Now here is your categorization. Again, follow your company procedure or the guideline you, your company is referring to to make this decision criteria. Like in this criteria, I have set, set 20 to 25. If your risk level is value comes up to be more than 20, then it's extreme risk and immediate, immediate action is required. Or if possible, the activity should be stopped. That is, notify the supervisor of safety and health representative and implement immediate actions to minimize the injury. Remedial action is required within two working days. Again, this may vary. Your company may say about one working day, 24 hours or 40 hours, whatever. Just follow your company procedure. 6 to 10 value is moderate risk. Implement the immediate action to minimize the injury, like sign supervisors. Maybe a remedial action may be required with five working days because the risk level is lower here. And one to five, we call it low risk. It's also called residual risk. So residual risk is also one of the term used in uh, OSAS 18001. It's the level of risk that remains after the implementation of all practicable control measures because you can you can never nullify the hazard. There has to be hazard. Same is the case. We can never achieve 100% safety. The figure may look good in a, in a policy or in a procedure in a book that we will achieve 100%. Uh, safety, but it's not practicable. We, we may achieve like 99.9999, but not 100% because we, we are always living with the hazards. 100% safety is only possible when there is no hazard, and even if you are sitting on a fresh green land, still there are hazards. There may be earthquake, there may be plane crash on your head, or there may be some insects. Even if you are sitting in an office environment which is considered to be relatively low hazardous as compared to nuclear or oil and gas or offshore industries. Still, you have you are using electricity, you have rotating parts, you may have printer, scanner, vibration, and you have ergonomics hazard there. So, some, some risk level will always be residual after the introduction of all control base. Like we were talking about electricity. So, electricity, we just discussed that likelihood is maybe two or three. And one thing, when, when you give the values to likelihood, there is always some argument of value. Again, there, there may be argument between 3 and 4 or 4 and 5, but there must not be an argument between 1 and 5. So in case of 1 and 5, someone has to rethink about the value or the justification. But in case of an argument between, let's say, 2 and 3, you just have to discuss between yourself why you why someone want to give two value and why the other person want to give three value and then come up with one value to, to be written in the risk assessment sheet. Okay, so this way we'll calculate the risk level of all the hazards and here is our decision criteria that it's that is in written form and we'll follow this written uh, decision criteria to take the control measure. Like here is another example of what is the risk level of being run over by other of the world. 
so there is a very low likelihood that someone will be crossing the, this road and a vehicle will appear at the same time and the person will be hit by the vehicle. Very low likelihood. But surety is high because the person collision with the vehicle that may be uh, being driven on like 40, 50 or 60 kilometers per hour speed. Another example, the risk level of being run over by a vehicle when crossing a busy road in, in a town, in any town of the world. In here, surety is the same as in the previous case, like this one. So still, surety is the same because in both cases, the person is being run over by a vehicle. But in this case, the likelihood is high. So you are crossing, if you're crossing this road, there are more chances that you, you may be hit by a vehicle. So what is the risk level of being run over when crossing a quiet cycle path in a countryside? So a countryside, not that busy road, and you are you are being hit by a cycle. So in this case, likelihood is low and severity is low as well. Because even if an accident happens, you are hit by a cycle, you won't face as much consequences as you may face in case of collision with a car or bus. So here is the summary. So moving from this one, this particular event has a particular likelihood and severity. If we, from this scenario, we move to this scenario, likelihood increases and even the severity increases. And if we move to this scenario, likelihood probably the same depending depending on the situation, but severity in here, if it's bicycle in this scenario, maybe severity is the same in both the cases. But if it's a vehicle, then of course severity is much higher in this case as compared to one at the top. So how do we make the decision? Here is a simple illustration. You see here, you have your system and you do the hazard identification. Hazard is just an abbreviation. Hazard identification using any appropriate technique. We have different techniques, qualitative or quantitative techniques. FTA is just fault tree analysis and event tree analysis and many more techniques like layers of protection analysis, bow tie analysis, uh, checklist, what if analysis, failure modes and effect analysis has a, the different uh, techniques that we had studied earlier. So you identify the hazard and you use different techniques to analyze the risk levels. So until this point, you are analyzing your risk. Then comes in your risk metrics or alarm principle. Let's say you have a risk level of 16, likelihood is 4, severity is 4, even in case of electricity, if we apply in our matrix. So, it can, it, likelihood is 4, let's say, and severity can be fatality of 1%, severity 4. 16 may not be acceptable, so we have to reduce it to a large region. It's an, a short name of as low as reasonably practicable. And again, what determines our practicability? Time, cost, efforts. Everything. So we have to always make a balance of the level of safety and time, cost, and efforts. So you analyze your risk and then you do the risk assessment. You apply the metrics, let's say, keeping it simple, like we have studied before. You just apply the metrics on your identified hazards, and this is called risk assessment. Then you evaluate it with the benefit, with the cost, with the efforts. What would be the benefit? Or you evaluate it with your benchmark. Of Let's say on 25, our risk level must not be, let's say, go beyond 12. So 12 is not acceptable for you, below 12 is acceptable. So here is your criteria, here is your evaluation criteria. So until this point, you see here risk analysis, until here risk assessment, until this point, it's called risk evaluation. And then if the risk, you have evaluated your risk and let's say it's not acceptable for you, so you will make some decision, you will implement some more control measures to reduce the risk level. So your decision, this is the whole process and until this point it's called risk management. So this whole picture, you will see different terminologies that we frequently use when we uh, try to implement those as 18,001 or when we carry out risk assessment like hazard, hazard, risk analysis, risk assessment, risk evaluation, risk management. So we need, we need to identify the difference between these terminologies. And meanwhile, if any one of you has any question, just write down on your screen, on, on the chat box, and I'll try to answer that question at the same time. And even after the webinar, if you have any question, you have my email ID already, and you can drop me an email, and I'll try to answer it as soon as possible.
So we have get, uh, done our risk evaluation and now it's the time to determine the controls. Let's say we had an identified 50 hazards and out of those 50 hazards there were 20 hazards for which the value of the risk is not acceptable for us. So at this point we need to take more control measures to reduce the risk level. And here is the hierarchy that we apply to control the risk. You can also remember it by the acronym ERIC P E R I C P. So our first preference must be eliminate, eliminate the hazard if possible, if practicable, because in, in many cases it is not practicable. For example, you may be using a diesel generator for your office just as a backup if there is an electric breakdown. So eliminate the hazard, that diesel generator is a hazard because you must be storing some amount of diesel as well. So it's a hazard, why not get rid of, get rid of it, eliminate that hazard. But this might not be practicable because you may be carrying out some critical activities in your office and you want you don't want that those activities to be interrupted. So it's not practicable in, in this case. The second most preferred option would must be reduce or substitute the hazard. Reduce the hazard. Okay, we cannot eliminate the hazard, but why not reduce it? Like taking on the same example, if you have to use that diesel generator and you have to use uh, and you have to keep some inventory of diesel on your side then instead of storing 1000 liter of fuel, why not store 200 liters? 1000 liters is maybe sufficient for you for let's say one month, but 200 still is enough for around five days to, to a week. So, so that even if there is an accident, which is fire in this case most probably, the consequence, consequences would be lower. Or substitute it with something less hazardous. So substitute petrol with diesel because diesel is less flammable. Or substitute some or toxic chemical with irritant chemical which is less hazardous. Okay, if it's not practicable, then isolate. Isolate the hazard from the people. So fuel is a hazard, keep fuel away from the workforce so that even if there is an accident, it cannot affect the workforce or your site. If there is not sufficient space isolation, either increase the distance or install a barrier in between the hazard and yourself. It's called isolation. Again, this may be practicable or not. The next control element in control hierarchy is control, <laughs> our engineering and management control. This is the element where we apply most of the control here because first three are not practicable in many cases, and especially the first two. So here comes our engineering and management control. In, in the example we are discussing of a diesel operated generator, maybe design of the system, a burned wall, spill kits, fire extinguishers, safety signages, no smoking policy, barricade the area, and think super V and maybe a PTW, so things like that. So we apply different engineering and management controls. And then at the end is our personal protective equipment, like our protection. So PPEs comes at, as the last line of defense because PPEs fail to danger. PPEs do not deal with the hazard, they just protect you. If you think about eliminate, there's no hazard, so it's more safer. Reduce, hazard is reduced, so there will be less consequences. But if you talk about PPEs, hazard is still there. So you're not doing anything with the hazard, you're just protecting yourself in case there is an accident. So PPEs are, must always be the last line of defense. Also PPEs, they just pure, with PPEs, you're relying on humans. It's And humans tend to violate in the safety field, we say humans are the most unreliable species. So you can't rely on humans that he'll be wearing a hard hat or safety shoes or a full body harness or earplugs or any other PPE when required. So you can prioritize and give a time scale. Again, it's just uh, an example here. Follow your company procedure, what time scale and priority you have given for your understanding. We have given here that 20 to 25 was classified as extreme risk. So it must be a first priority. Next. 12 to 18 high second priority and 1 to 5 is low and our fourth priority. So we need to control these hazards first time because they are more risky for them. Likelihood and severity is low. When we apply the control measures, keep one thing in mind. In many cases, we are only able or it's only practicable to reduce the likelihood. In most of the cases, we are not reducing the severity. Like, take the case of electricity. Regardless of the control measures you install, you, you're not reducing the severity of the electricity. It's still the same because you are still dealing with 110 or 220 volts. 
you apply double insulation, you use armored cores, this earthing system, you have used RCDs, you have uh, imparted training to your staff, you are following lockout tagger procedure, and uh, there's supervision also, you have carried out the risk assessment still, and you have used using the rubber mats as well. So with all these control measures, you are reducing the chances that of someone getting electing you. Its severity is still the same. Severity will reduce when you reduce the voltage because voltage or amperes is the factor that determines the severity. So when you reduce the risk level to below 25 volts, below 25 volts is not considered to be lethal as per different research studies and guidelines. So as long as you are working above 25 volts, it still severity is the same. So same is the case, let's say work at height, you are working on a scaffolding. So that scaffolding is erected by computer scaffolders, area is barricaded, you have permit to work, the people working above, they are very full body harness, they are trained, they are competent, they, they have moved their harness to a lifeline, load test was also carried out, supervision is also there, risk assessment is also carried out. With all these control measures, you are reducing the likelihood of someone falling. If someone falls from, let's say, 50 meter height, he will die. Now reduce the height, reduce the height from 50 meter to 10 meter, still you, have, you are not reducing the severity. Severity is still fatality because working about 2 meters height as per the British guidelines can be lethal. So you can reduce the severity when you do your job differently. Like if you have to paint a ceiling, so instead of using a ladder or scaffolding and going above 2 meter height, why not use a roller brush and paint the ceiling from the ground level. So when you perform your task differently when you deal with the hazard itself, then only you can say, now I have reduced the severity level as well. So next step, record your findings and you just make a sheet. There are different formats. Typically, it's, uh, you have like five, six uh, columns on a piece of paper. On the top, you just write area or activity for which you are carrying out the risk assessment, your date, uh, names of the risk assessment team. And then you make the column. In first column, you identify the hazard. In second column, you see other people on the risk. In third column, you write the likelihood. Next column, you write severity. Next column, you write the value of risk. Next column, you write if that risk is acceptable for you as, as per your acceptance criteria or as per the allowed region as for the risk matrix. If it's acceptable, okay, continue the best practices because the hazard is already under, under control. If it's not acceptable, then your suggestions. What else you need to do, what additional take, control measures you need to take to reduce the risk level. And then at the bottom of the sheet, typically, uh, the risk assessment team, they place their signature and they write a review period. So you need to review your risk assessment as well, which is the next step. So you need to review your risk assessment if there is any change, any change in your process, any change in your technology, any change in workplace environment, in your equipment, maybe you are doing your job differently now. Before you had no cranes, now you have introduced a crane in your facility, so you need to review your risk assessment because hazards have been changed. Previously, you did not have any generator in your facility, but now you have installed a generator to cope up with the electric brake cars. So you need to review your risk assessments or any change in law because it's a legal requirement as, as well to conduct the risk assessment in most countries of the world. So if the law changes, then again you may have to review your risk assessment. And additionally, if there is no change, still you have to review it periodically, which is typically done once in a year. Typically, again, it, it, uh, as, as the OSAS says, you have to re review it periodically. So this frequency will be decided by the risk assessment team. It could be like six months, it could be one year, or it could be three years as in American OSHA system or PSM standards, uh, they ask for the three years as well. Also, you need to review your risk assessment after a serious accident or ill health case because an accident means failure of your risk assessment. If your risk assessment had been good enough, there would have been no accident because you must have identified the hazard, you must have identified all the control measures to reduce, uh, to control that risk. So, accident means failure of your risk assessment and you need to review your risk assessment and you may have to incorporate some additional layers of controls in your risk assessment. So with this one, I'll finish this webinar on risk assessment. If you have any question, you can just write in your chat box and I'll try to answer the question or just drop me an email. Mohammed?
I would like to thank you for all very yes or Thank you. We have two ki uh, we have two kind of questions. Uh, do you want me to read them? Uh, yeah, sure. Just read me the okay. question. Uh, can the you first the statement of the questions here? Yes, you can find it on the in the question box here in the control panel. I can read it. It's not very long. It's short. Short questions. Okay, I can see one. Uh, what is Allah? Exactly. Okay, Allah. It's a terminology which is uh, used in the British system. It's a British in British legal system also. They use this terminology. It stands for as low as reasonably practicable. As we dis discussed a couple of examples as well. That we know has and we need to control it, but we are we can so far we are only able to control the likelihood of plane crashes, not the severity. Still today with current technology for plane crashes, there is there are chances of fatality. So practicality, practicality, we can reduce this level. We can reduce the chances of fatality if we start traveling. We start using to to two thousand miles away on our feet. On foot, but it's not because it will take a lot of time. It will take lots of effort. So we accept. Sometimes we accept a risk to get some benefits, and those benefits are in terms of cost, time, and efforts. So this stands for the law terminology. Thank you. Thank you for your answer, Mohammed. We have only the last question. It says, kindly explain H-A-Z-O-P in detail. Hazard. Hazard is just a general term. It stands for hazard identification. H-A-Z is hazard. I-D is identification. Hazard identification. So if you could let me go to our initial slides in here. Now, these methodologies, they are risk assessment methodologies, and first step in any risk assessment is identification of hazard. Now, in all these terminologies, in all these methodologies, regardless of which methodology, Let's say, keeping it simple, I have developed hazards. Machinery on your as as fixed have to identify different hazards, let's say, in an office and home. Like in my office, I have electricity, I have water dispenser, I have slippery floors, I have trailing cables, I have ergonomics hazards. I have lighting, ventilation, temperature issues. I have lights, delays because I'm using computer stations. I have paper shredders, computer. So you need to identify these hazards and hazard stand for hazards identification. Okay, Mohammed. Thank you very much for your time and excellent presentation. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. We are going to answer all your questions through email. For being part of PCB's upcoming webinars and updated with the latest news, I invite you to join our social media and PCB YouTube channel. Thank you for your attention and have a nice day. Thank you very much, Paul, and have a nice day.